Welcome. Welcome, everyone. Welcome to you all, whether you're here with us in the church in Plymouth. Welcome to those of you on Zoom. And welcome to everyone joining us in Brighton. And also welcome to our friends from the Plymouth Baha'i community. So um, our theme actually for this month of July is friendship. So it's lovely to be starting the month with so many different friends in different places. The British novelist and playwright Frances Hodgson Burnett wrote, if you look the right way, you can see that the whole world is a garden. And that's kind of the way we're going to be looking uh, on this July summer morning, because this service is going to take the form of a flower communion. I know that's a service that's familiar to some of you and unfamiliar to others, but I hope you will all enjoy it. It's a service that was originally designed by the Reverend Norbert Chapek for his Unitarian congregation in Prague in 1923. And it's become a popular service in Unitarian congregations around the world ever since. We'll be using some of Chapek's own words. We'll be singing one of his hymns and we'll be taking part in the flower communion ritual, which he devised and hearing a little bit about his life and legacy too. But let's begin as we always do by lighting our chalice flame. And those of you at home or in Brighton, I hope you will be able to light your chalices with me now. <laughs> I hope you're having better luck than I am. We are a welcoming people of diverse beliefs who commit to nourishing the spirit, broadening the mind, nurturing the earth and building community. May this flame we kindle remind us to strive today and every day to love beyond belief. Now I'm going to ask you to hold on to your flowers for just a little longer while we sing our first hymn this morning, which appropriately enough is called Bring Flowers to Our Altar. That's hymn number 13 in the purple hymn books if you're using a hymn book. Otherwise, you'll see the words on the screen.
So the central ritual of a flower communion service is the sharing not of bread and wine, but of flowers. But we first begin with a meditation. Now I know most of you, I think, have brought a flower to the service or you've been able to pick one up on the way in. If you don't have a physical flower with you, then I invite you to bring one of your own choice into your imagination as we go through this simple meditation on the flowers. So begin by simply taking time to be with your flower, to hold it and to observe it. This flower is part of creation, like you. It has grown, it has blossomed, and it will also die like each one of us. It is unique, as are you. And it has beauty to offer and things to teach to those who are open to learning, as you also do. So take this moment to observe your flower's colour, its shape, its form. and look a little more closely into its details. The nuances of colour. The extraordinary details. Tiny hairs, perhaps. Veins on leaves. Stamens, and so on. It is a work of art. And consider the characteristics of your flower. Perhaps it is tall, strong, bold. Maybe it is pale, delicate, shy. Does your flower grow alone or in company? And does it remind you of anyone? Yourself, perhaps? Someone you love? And consider how you have come to be holding this flower at this time, in this place. And having spent a little time with your flower, I'm going to invite you, now you've bonded with it, to give it away. In a moment you'll hear some music and I'm going to invite you, whether you're here in Plymouth or in Brighton, to come forward in turn to put your flower into the communal vase at the front. And this will be the first stage of the ritual of our flower communion today. If you're on Zoom, then I invite you to hold your flower up so that all of you can see what you've bought and maybe put the name of the flower or any description of it in the chat box. So when you're ready, do please come forward and place your flowers in the vase.
Thank you so much to everyone for bringing your flowers and sharing them um, in this first part of our ritual. And I would like to now offer a blessing for the flowers. And these are words written by Norbert Chapek. Infinite spirit of life. We ask for your blessing on these, your messengers of fellowship and love. May they remind us amid diversities of knowledge and of gifts to be one in desire and affection and devotion to your holy will. May they also remind us of the value of comradeship of doing and sharing alike. May we cherish friendship as one of your most precious gifts. May we not let awareness of another's talents discourage us or sully our relationship. But may we realize that whatever we can do, great or small, the efforts of all of us are needed to do your work in this world. Amen. Amen. Now I mentioned that we have some friends here from the Baha'i community and um, in the spirit of sharing and friendship, uh, I invite Arazu to come forward to the lectern and share a reading from the Baha'i tradition, which she and I felt fitted this occasion. Thank you, Arasu. Consider the flowers of a garden. Though differing in kind, colour, form and shape, yet inasmuch as they are refreshed by the waters of one spring, revived by the breath of one wind, invigorated by the rays of one sun, this diversity increaseth their charm and addeth to their beauty. How unpleasing to the eye if all the flowers and plants, the leaves and blossoms, the fruit, the branches of the tree of that garden were all the same shape and colour. Diversity, hues, form and shape, enrich and adorn the garden, and heighteneth the effect thereof. In like manner, when diverse shades of thought, temperament and character are brought together under the power and influence of one central agency, the beauty and glory of human perfection will be revealed and made manifest. Naught but the celestial potency of the word of God, which ruleth and transcendeth the realities of all things, is capable of harmonizing the divergent thoughts, sentiments, ideas, and convictions of the children of men. Baha'u'llah. Thank you, Arazu. I mentioned that we would be singing um, a hymn that was written by Norbert Chapek. Uh, he wrote the words as well as the music, and it's number 43 in our green hymn books. 43, it's called, universal spirit 
Um, and this, um, the words, in fact, of course he wrote in Czech, but the words have been translated by Reverend Richard Bokey, who I know some of you will know. And um, the music's been arranged by David Dawson. So it's a very Unitarian collaboration, this hymn. And uh, it's the, the recording isn't the best, but it's the only one we've got. So this is Universal Spirit, number 43. It's a beautiful hymn, that one, I think, uh, in spite of the slightly muffly recording. We're now coming to a time of silence and reflection. And this is an opportunity for you to use the time for your own prayer or meditation, or simply to just sit and listen to the sounds inside the room, uh, maybe outside, or maybe the sounds of your own heart and breathing. So do take this time for yourself. So the Reverend Dr. Norbert Chapek was a preacher and a thinker. 
and someone who truly stood up for what he believed in. He lived in a time when believing in and practicing freedom of thought and religion was considered dangerous by others. Maybe it still is. He was born in what was then Bohemia in 1870. He and his wife, Maya, had fled to the USA in 1914 with their eight children as a result of their non-conformist views. But they returned to the recently independent Czechoslovakia, as it was then, in 1921. And there they founded a Unitarian congregation in Prague. And it grew, and it grew. And at one time there were reportedly as many as 8,000 Unitarians around the country, but all linked in one way or another to Chapek congregation. Imagine. <laughs> Though apparently he was quite small um, physically, in stature, he nonetheless became acclaimed as one of the nation's leading orators. And he wrote actually more than 90 hymns, often as we have already experienced writing both the words and the music. But for some time with his congregation, he had felt the need to um, find a kind of ritual that would help people bind more closely together. And the format had to be one that wouldn't alienate anyone who had forsaken any other religious tradition, as many of his own congregation had in fact done. And so he felt he held his first flower communion, drawing on the elements of nature. And he held that in 1923. Later in 1939, of course, it became clear that the Nazis were about to invade Czechoslovakia. And at that time, Čapek's friends urged him to leave the country because by now his wide reputation as a preacher, as um, a, an editor, a newspaper editor, as a teacher and lecturer, he, he did a lot with his time. All of this put him in a dangerous position, he, but he refused to leave. Although his wife, Maya, at the last minute did go, she was also ordained as a, Unit as a Unitarian minister. She went to the United States um, to embark on a lecture tour, and that was to raise funds for refugees in Europe. So resonances for us today, I think. Chapek himself, as I said, he refused to go and he continued his work, which became increasingly risky. The British um, minister, Reverend Eric Sherville Price wrote that because of the monotheistic beliefs of the Unitarians, Chapek was able to accept into membership a number of Jews who would otherwise have been rounded up by the Gestapo. And this gave them precious time in which to plan their escape from the country. But when after two years, this merciful plan was discovered, Chapek was arrested along with his daughter, Zora, for the crime of listening to the BBC on the radio. He was also accused of high treason and several of his sermons were used in evidence against him. Eventually, Chapek was sent to Dachau concentration camp and Zora to a labor camp. But even in Dachau, Chapek worked hard 
to lift people's spirits. A friend wrote of him that he was like a flower himself, blooming among the ashes of hopelessness and despair. And though almost a year after his arrest, his name appears among prisoners sent on the 12th of October 1942 to Hartheim Castle near Linz in Austria, where he died of poison gas. Those who knew him said that his spirit was never crushed. Before he died, he wrote, it is worthwhile to live and fight courageously for sacred ideals. Even though disappointed a thousand times or fallen in the fight and when everything would seem worthless, he wrote, I have lived amidst eternity. Be grateful, my soul. My life was worth living. Be grateful, my soul. My, wor my life was worth living. I think they're wonderful words with which to end a life. And also words to carry with us in life. So Chapek chose flowers for his communion because of their obvious beauty, because of their incredible diversity and for nature's capacity to transcend division between faiths and opinions. I think he hoped that his congregation, which included fugitives from other faiths, as we've said, and refugees from other lands, would recognise these qualities and possibilities in themselves and in each other. I think he hoped the service would help them value more fully each other's unique gifts and contributions to their community and also to the wider world. And I know that he said this, May we realise that whatever we can do, large or small, the efforts of all of us are needed to do work in the world. Just like the flower, we too are each special and beautiful in our own way. In our precious Unitarian free faith, we recognise and celebrate both our humanity and our divinity, as well as our complete interdependence with the whole of creation. And so I think Chapek surely also hoped that the flowers would not be seen merely as symbols Rather that they, like us, like all life, are graced with the presence of divine spark, what we might call spirit. And that when we hold a flower in our hands, we know that at some level we are holding the whole universe. For it is creation made of the same sunlight and moonlight stardust and atmospheres, oceans and earth as we are. He surely hoped that we might learn to hold all life, including each other, with the kind of awed reverence we might hold a newborn baby not only for what it might bring to our lives or offer us or teach us or bring us joy, though all those are wonderful, but above all for its own intrinsic worth, for its own unique manifestation 
of the divine. For being simply and fully itself. Beyond comparison. Beyond belief. May it be so. And now we come to the final part, I suppose you would call it, of our flower communion ritual. And we have given, and now it is time to receive. So again, in a moment, I'll ask you to come forward, and this time to choose a flower from the communal vase. Something that speaks to you. Preferably not the one you brought yourself. But in the spirit of this communion service, to take something that someone else has brought. And when you sit down with your chosen flower, once again, to just be with it, to notice it and observe it and handle it with care and love. It is a gift that someone else has brought for you. It is also a gift from the universe. And if you're on Zoom again, if you, and it's got quite the same for you, I'm sorry about that, but if you can hold up your flowers again so that others can see them and maybe choose one. They can't actually physically take it with them, but I think they can take it with them in their hearts. So please do come forward when you hear the music.
Thank you for taking part in today's Flower Communion. And let's sing our final hymn today, which is hymn number 208, back in the purple books again. And this is When Our Heart Is In A Holy Place, hymn 208. I hope you managed to keep up with that in Brighton. Tripped us up a bit here, I have to say, <laughs> but it's a lovely hymn. Uh, in a moment, I'd like to share some closing words with you by Lynn Ungar. What a gathering. The purple tongues of iris licking out at spikes of lupin. The orange crepe skirts of poppies lifting over buttercup and daisy. Who can be grim in the face of such abundance? There is nothing to compare, no need for beauty to compete. The voluptuous rhododendron and the plain grass are equally filled with themselves. Equally declare the miracles of colour and form. This is what community looks like. This vibrant jostle, stem by stem, declaring the marvellous joining. This is the face of communion. The incarnation once more gracefully resurrected from winter. Hold these things together in your sight. Purple, crimson, magenta, blue. You will be feasting on this long after the flowers are gone. <laughs>